Good evening. My name is Matt Zwolinski. I am a professor of philosophy here at the University of San Diego, and I am the founder and director of a new institute here at San Diego, uh, the Center for Ethics, Economics, and Public Policy. Uh, tonight is the opening event of that center, so I am very happy and honored that you could all join us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The goal of the center is to bring serious, rigorous academic insight to bear on some of the most challenging and important questions of public policy of the day. The center is driven by a belief that both moral wisdom and economic pragmatism are necessary to understand how our laws and economic institutions work and how they should be made to work. And the center is equally driven by the conviction that our best chance of making progress on these hard issues is listening to and critically engaging with a diversity of viewpoints, including viewpoints that are sometimes underrepresented on college campuses. Tonight's event, and indeed the center itself, uh, would not be possible without the generous support of our donors and so I'd like to take just a few moments to single out for special acknowledgement uh, a few of those who are with us tonight. Uh, my deepest, deepest gratitude to Malin Burnham and to James Brennan, who have been the center's most stalwart supporters since its very beginning. Thanks to both of you. Thank you to Noel Norton and Andrew Allen, my dean and provost respectively, for their support in building this institution. And thanks to Thanks to Hank Nordoff, who's here with us tonight, and to Kevin Washington and Peter Farrell, who could not be, for their extremely generous financial support. I'd also finally like to thank the John Templeton Foundation and their Institute for Humane Studies for their financial support of this night's debate in particular. Uh, we've got a lot of exciting events lined up um, for this year and for future academic years. On November 14th, we're bringing to campus Joanna Williams, author of Academic Freedom in an Age of Conformity, who's gonna speak to us about intellectual diversity in higher education. And on March 16th, next semester, uh, we've got Brian Kaplan, a colleague of Don's at uh, George Mason University, and Christopher Wellman, a philosopher from St. Louis University, who are gonna be debating the issue of immigration, uh, and specifically the question of whether free migration is a basic human right. At the end of tonight's debate, I'm almost done talking, uh, I've got a brief survey for you uh, brought to us by our sponsors to uh, find out how you like tonight's debate and what you'd like to see in the future. Uh, so if you could please fill that out online, it just takes a few minutes on your phone. We'd very much appreciate that. If you're here for passport points, and I see a number of ears uh, perking up. Uh, if you're here for passport points, uh, Will Considine, who's seated right there, and there he goes, reluctantly waving. Uh, you can see him at the end of the debate, and uh, he will take your email address or your USDID number and log you in so that you get full credit. All right, with that, I am going to turn things over to Dove Fox, who is going to be moderating tonight's uh, debate and who will introduce our two debaters. Dove Fox. Thank you all, welcome. Our topic this evening is the morality and economics of California's new minimum wage law. Earlier this year, California Governor Jerry Brown signed into law a bill that will raise California's minimum wage from 10 to $15 per hour by the year 2022. Now some have celebrated this law as a victory for the many poor California citizens who are working full-time jobs and yet struggling to make ends meet under the state's high cost of living. Others argue the minimum wage law is an ineffective way to fight poverty, and one that besides risks bad side effects ranging from economic stagnation to fewer paid jobs available for vulnerable pay populations like minority youth. Does the $15 minimum wage for California make economic sense? Does it advance social justice? Sounds like the makings of a debate. Well, there we have it, folks. To help us work through these questions, we have with us this evening two eminently qualified debaters, Mike Conksel and Don Boudreau. Arguing in favor of the minimum wage law, Mike Conksel 
is a fellow at the Roosevelt Institute where he works on financial reform, unemployment, inequality, and a progressive vision of the economy. His blog, Rorty Bomb, was named by Time Magazine one of the 25 best financial blogs in the country. His writing has appeared in the Boston Review, The American Prospect, The Washington Monthly, The Nation, Slate, and Dissent. Please join me in welcoming Mike Konzel. Arguing against the minimum wage law, Don Boudreau is a senior fellow with the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. He's also a Mercatus Center board member and a professor of economics at George Mason University. He specializes in globalization and trade, law and economics, and antitrust economics. You can find his writings in the pages of the Wall Street Journal, the U.S. News and World Report, as well as on his blog, Cafe Hayek. Please welcome Don Boudreau. Each of our debaters will have 10 minutes for opening arguments, followed by seven for rebuttal, and finally, four minutes of closing argument before we open up the conversations to questions from you all in our audience. With that, Mike Consul. Oh, <laughs> Don Boudreau. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. I'm told that uh, they're going to be very strict in time, so I'll get right to it. I'm honored to be here. I'm honored to be in the same uh, uh, event as, as Mike. Thanks to Matt and to all of you who made this possible. Let me begin with three prefatory remarks. First, I trust that everyone here shares the goal of having low-skilled workers paid incomes as high as possible with no one forced into the ranks of the unemployed or obliged to suffer other negative consequences. That is the value judgment that I carry with me throughout tonight's discussion and in every discussion that I have about the minimum wage. Second, my main concern is for the well-being of low-skilled workers. My assessment of the minimum wage turns overwhelmingly on how, how, <clears throat> excuse me, how well or how poorly it is likely to benefit such workers. Only secondarily do I care about the effects on employers or investors or consumers. You might disagree with my conclusions, I'm certain many of you will, but that disagreement will be over predicted consequences and not over values or goals. Third, my principal purpose here is to try to persuade you of the reasonableness of the standard economic case that the minimum wage harms some of its intended beneficiaries. I recognize that the minimum wage also helps some people by raising their wages. Although analyzing this trade-off isn't my main purpose, I will say a few words about it near the end of these remarks. I choose this as my main purpose because the principal case for the minimum wage, the case for it that's almost always made, is that it raises all low-skilled workers' wages and incomes without harming any of them. It's this case that I believe to be most, to be most clearly incorrect until and unless all politicians and pundits who support the minimum wage concede the possibility that it harms some low-skilled workers, I believe that the public discussion is flawed and misleading. So I do oppose minimum wages. I oppose them chiefly because economics tells me that by raising employers' cost of employing low-skilled workers, the minimum, wage, the minimum wage makes the employment of these workers less attractive and thus destroys jobs for some of these workers. And losing jobs means not only losing income, but also losing opportunities to gain valuable work experience. The result is unintended harm to some, and perhaps many, low-skilled workers. In addition, the effects of the minimum wage, both positive and negative, aren't distributed randomly. By reducing the number of jobs for low-skilled workers, while simultaneously drawing into the workforce other workers, housewives, retirees, college students drawn in by the higher minimum wage. It makes the pool of workers competing for these jobs larger. The risk is real that those workers who get and keep jobs at the higher minimum wage are workers who need higher incomes the least, and the workers who do not get jobs, who are denied jobs, are workers who need any incomes the most. Choosing from a larger pool of applicants for a smaller number of jobs employers are too likely, too often, to choose a safe applicant. 
the, the recent immigrant, the, the single mom, the inner city minority uh, teen will be overlooked. That's what happens when employers can become more choosy when the number of jobs shrinks and the number of, of workers competing for those jobs rises. So let me explain a little bit more clearly my worries. The potential for the minimum wage to destroy jobs for low-skill workers is the effect most feared by economists. I believe that this fear is justified. The classic economic argument for the minimum wage rests on the central pillar of modern economics, the law of demand. You get rid of that law of demand, you get rid of its validity, you get rid of modern economics. Some people might think that's good. I make my living as an economist, I think it would be bad. The law of demand says that if the cost of taking any action rises, people will take that action less frequently. Importantly, this law lies not only at the heart of economics, it's a proposition that every one of us takes as a practical rule of reality every day. For example, many environmentalists want to tax carbon emissions because they correctly understand that such a tax reduces carbon emissions. Many conservatives oppose such a tax because they correctly understand that that tax will reduce the industrial activities that cause carbon emissions. Many skeptics of globalization want a Tobin tax on short-term currency speculation because they correctly understand that such a tax will reduce such speculation. By the very same logic, a government-imposed requirement that employers raise the pay of low-skill workers will make the employment of such workers less attractive and thus destroy jobs for at least some of those workers. Indeed, the minimum wage works as a tax on the employment of low-skill workers. To employ such workers, firms must pay more. The fact that the additional payment goes to the workers rather than to the government is, in this case, irrelevant. From the employer's perspective, it's a mandated extra payment, a tax, for every hour of low-skill workers employed. So if a Tobin tax reduces short-term currency speculation, if taxing carbon emissions reduces carbon emissions, why will taxing firms for employing low-skill workers not reduce the amount of low-skill work that they employ? My understanding of reality is that it will reduce the number of low-skill workers who have jobs. Almost all economists until 20 years ago opposed the minimum wage because they feared these employment consequences. This opposition was supported not only by economic theory, but also by empirical research, perhaps the most famous instance of which was the 1981 Minimum Wage Study Commission report, which found that roughly a 10% increase in the minimum wage caused about a 3% reduction in teenage unemployment, teenagers being a proxy for low-skilled workers. That was the consensus until the mid-90s. In the mid-90s, a new wave of empirical research commenced, much of which finds that minimum wage hikes have indeed no negative employment effects. This new research is undone, it must be said, the, the pre-1990 consensus among economists. However, it hasn't yet convinced a majority of economists that the classic prediction of job losses is wrong. One year ago this month, the University of Chicago released the results of a survey that it took of, of 42 top economists, including two Nobel laureates, Angus Deaton and Eric Maskin. These economists were asked to agree or disagree with the following proposition, and I'm quoting now. If the federal minimum wage is raised gradually to $15 per hour by 2020, the employment rate for low-wage U.S. workers will be substantially lower than it would be under the status quo, end quote. A plurality, 25% of the surveyed economists, agreed with this proposition. Some even did so strongly. That was a, a survey option. But it was close. 24% disagreed, although none disagreed strongly. 38% were uncertain. Others didn't vote on that issue. In other words, slightly more of the surveyed economists last year agreed than disagree that this size hike in the minimum wage will shrink substantially the employment prospects of low-skill workers. The survey, that survey question, though, asked about a very large increase in the minimum wage. What about one closer to the one now proposed for California, a 50% a rise from $10 in California to $15? A 2013 survey, also by Chicago, uh, also of the same prominent economists and same Nobel Prize winners, asked the following question. Raising the federal minimum wage to $9 per hour would make it noticeably harder for low-skilled workers to find employment. That's a 24% rise, by the way, from 7.25 to 9. Here also a plurality, 34% agreed that the, even a 24% rise in the minimum wage would make it noticeably more difficult for low-skilled workers to find jobs. In neither of these surveys are a majority of economists persuaded by the new minimum wage research, a fact that tells me, at the very least, that the jury in this question is still out, or more plausibly, that economists still, correctly, largely agree that minimum wages have negative employment effects. 
I'm with those economists who agree that the minimum wage, rising even modestly, hurts many low-skilled workers. The reason is not because I reject empirical evidence. I don't. Instead, the reason is that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, and it's an extraordinary claim that the standard prediction of the law of demand does not hold in one market, that is, the market for low-skilled workers. So while there are indeed some recent studies that find that minimum wages don't destroy jobs, what you'll miss if you get your information today from most news sources and blogs is that there's also a lot of evidence, in fact, even more evidence, many, much of it very recent, that minimum wages do, in fact, destroy jobs to many low-skilled workers. David Newmark from UC Irvine and William Washer are today perhaps the most prominent contributors to this anti-minimum wage research. Here's their book, the 2008 book published by MIT Press, cleverly entitled Minimum Wages. They supply here an exhaustive survey of the empirical literature. By their count, two-thirds of the empirical studies find, find job losses. Their survey of the empirical literature leads them to this conclusion, and here I'm quoting from page 287 of their book. Summary of evidence. Minimum wages reduce employment of low-skilled workers. Strength of conclusion, fairly unambiguous. A handful of studies find positive effects, some find no effect, but the preponderance of, of evidence points clearly to negative effects. Of course, they could, be, they could be wrong, they might be mistaken. My point here is not to defend their conclusion so much as it is to emphasize the fact that the empirical literature and the effects of the minimum wage does not contain extraordinary evidence against the standard proposition that raising the cost of employing low-skill workers will result in fewer of those workers being employed. So if the case that raising the minimum wage even might destroy jobs for some of the workers that it's meant to help, what right have we to embark upon this policy? I think none. Remember, the people who, whose livelihoods are here being experimented with are low-skilled workers. They aren't doctors, lawyers, machinists, welders, or college professors. They're motel maids, fast food workers, teens just entering the workforce. If minimum wage proponents are correct that no jobs are destroyed, then these workers are indeed benefited without cost to them. Although here, there's a question of who pays the cost of these workers' gains, and what is the moral uh, uh, reason for imposing that cost on those persons. For example, if we all agree that all low skill workers should be given raises, What's the moral justification for requiring only current employers of low-skilled workers to pay these costs? Why not pay these workers raises out of general revenues collected as taxes from the tax-paying population? It's a question that I think should be asked, but it is seldom asked. But what if basic economics and the bulk of the empirical studies are correct and minimum wage proponents are incorrect? We then have a policy that not only prices some willing workers out of jobs, and again, also out of opportunities to get job experience, which helps these people to get even higher wages in the future. But a policy that also distributes the bulk of its benefits to those who need those benefits the least, while it inflicts the bulk of its costs on those who can least afford such burdens. Don Boudreaux, even thank you very from, much. Uh, uh, one more paragraph. <laughs> even apart from the randomness of the distribution of such costs and benefits, what moral case is there for enabling some people to earn higher wages by pricing other people out of the labor market to earn no wages? I think none. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, to make the case in favor of the California minimum wage law, please welcome Mike Consul. Can everyone hear me? Excellent. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. This is a great debate, and I'm really excited to talk more with Don about this. I want to make two points for you in the next uh, 10 minutes. I'm going to watch this. I saw how vicious he was there, so I'm going to watch this time very closely. Um, two points. One is that in the portfolio of policies we use to boost wages on the low-end job market, the minimum wage is an essential one. It's not the only one, um, but it is essential complement to other tools that we have. And then, and then second, I want to make some arguments about a high minimum wage, such as California's $15 minimum wage. You don't have to necessarily buy a $15 minimum wage as a good idea to understand that the minimum wage is an important part. And I, see, and I think the, the focus on ethics and um, you know, kind of ethics of uh, policy under capitalism uh, is a good way just to kind of sit on the foundations, right? So there's a lot of studies. I don't think we're going to solve them here. Um, there's many studies that find um, an employment effect from higher minimum wage laws, there's so many that don't. Um, the ones that do tend to look at states as the individual 
Uh, that's like the Newmark studies and the Newmark approach. Others look at the borders between states. I'd like to think the second approach, I, I'd find the second approach more convincing even if I wasn't a minimum wage booster, but you know, that, you know, your, your uh, impact of that's gonna come and go. What I wanna explain to you is the economic case for why that might matter, why the, the law of demand might um, be com more complicated than the simple um, you know, geometry of it. The first is that, and this is totally true under the normal thing, is that um, uh, minimum wage might just be passed through in higher prices. So you know, minimum wage goes up and the cost of hamburgers go up five cents. Um, you know, I think this is what people often intuitively understand is everyone's going to pay a little bit more, but a lot of people will be taken out of poverty. Um, you know, this, this is very comfortable under the normal theoretical models, uh, and it's certainly something that, you know, I think we've seen internationally at times with big minimum wage increases in, say, Eastern Europe. Um, and that's, I think, people understand that. You pay a little bit more and the workers get a little bit more. And I think that's an intuitive case that a lot of people get. You don't need a massive government bureaucracy, a complicated tax code. Uh, it's, in, you know, that it's priced right into the services. The second, and I think this is very important, is something, um, the institutional approach. Um, if people are paid more, uh, suddenly managers have an incentive to get more out of them. So they'll invest more in capital. They'll do a better job training them. This is uh, what economists often call an efficiency wage. It's very rational to pay slightly above a marginal product if you know you can get more work out of someone. And you, know, you often hear people say that you know, when minimum wage goes up, there's slightly more investment in capital, slightly more investment to try to get their pro productivity up. And the third, and one I think is most important and most uh, convincing, is a kind of search model. So let's, um, you know, when, in this model of, of, of the way the labor market works, it's assumed that you can just kind of like go like to a grocery store and buy and sell as much labor as you want, like you would buy and sell as many oranges as you want at say a farmer's market. But you know, when you, if someone, you know, when you guys graduate and you go and you find a job, uh, you're probably gonna wanna celebrate the fact that you found a job in a way you don't celebrate the way you just bought groceries. Because finding a job takes search, it takes effort. Uh, it's not a trivial thing to do. And what happens is, is that in a, there's huge amounts of vacancies in low-wage jobs. And what we do find when minimum wage goes up, and I, I don't think this is as controversial in the literature as the job effect, is that job tenure increases. People keep the jobs longer. They don't quit as often. They search harder for them. This has a profound effect in tightening up the labor market and re, by reducing vacancies, you increase the jobs. And there's a case that's when, especially low-wage employers, have a little bit of market power there. They have the ability to keep wages not at the point where they would just close all vacancies. I mean, the, the, the reason the, the research got kicking in the 1990s is a lot of microeconomists were like, why are there so many job vacancies at McDonald's and Burger King? Why don't they just raise the wages slightly and eliminate them all? And this is where the search model came in, and this is where I think the kind of theoretical case for it came in. So there's plenty of stories under you know, efficiency wages, uh, search models. These are things economists talk about all the time, uh, and they make perfect economic sense to justify why these studies go. But let's move beyond the economic case. The first I'd say is that the minimum wage is very good at reducing poverty. Uh, people debate the job effect quite a bit. But Aaron Dubé, um, one minimum wage scholar, looked at 54 studies of the minimum wage impact and found that 48 of them found a large reduction in poverty. A 10% raise in the minimum wage was associated with a 2.4% drop in poverty. Um, you know, and it was an even larger effect on deep poverty. This is incredibly important, right? Because I think often when we're talking about jobs, we get the sense that it's, it's essentially stuck, right? Like if you try to increase it to the extent some people get more money, um, many more will lose their jobs, but it's definitely something that reduces poverty. More importantly, beyond just the specific, and it's important for California, you know, these numbers vary, but you know, the people in poverty are not teenagers, the people in poverty are not middle class kids or you know, middle class families. Um, the, you know, 96% of the people who would benefit, who will benefit from this $15 minimum wage are adults, not teens. 37% have children, half have some college, uh, nationwide, m more than 60% uh, are women. Uh, you know, this is definitely a target market that needs poverty reduction. So this is not, there are people who benefit, like all policies, uh, who aren't necessarily the most in need, but the, peop the majority of people who benefit are people who need poverty reduction. 
Crucially, even beyond this, um, David Otter and other people at MIT found that the minimum wage held, quote, held up the income distribution in the bottom half. We talk about inequality a lot. Um, we tend to think of like CEOs or professional class people, like kind of taking off from everyone else. But there's increasing inequality in the bottom half of the income distribution between, say, people at the 10% and 50%. And one of the main drivers of that is essentially where the minimum wage is. It's what set, essentially sets the standard for, for what happens there. There's also a so-called lighthouse effect. People above the minimum wage also get a pay raise. This is pretty found, you know, a lot throughout the economy. So or through the research. There's a lot of debate about why this might be. Perhaps if you don't make minimum wage now, you, um, you, know, you want to keep that relationship with your employer, or your employer feels that. So even if when the minimum wage goes up, people who are above it, above the new one, also get a pay raise. So it does trickle up in the economy. Now, um, what you often hear is, you know, if poverty reduction is important, why not expand the earned income tax credit? Why not use public money to pay workers through the tax code? And here's what I really want to point out is that the minimum wage is an essential complement to something like the EITC. And why is that? The EITC is complicated and difficult in the tax code. About 20% of people don't claim it who are eligible for it. Many people claim it who aren't eligible for it. There's a little bit of fraud. That simply just doesn't happen with the minimum wage. I mean, I, I, I don't even know how you would estimate it. But, you know, when you, the minimum wage is X, people will ask for X. And that's what it is. Um, you know, the, the EITC also goes through uh, tax preparers and other people who kind of get a cut of it. Um, many people who don't have children, for instance, um, don't benefit from the EITC. Like a lot of tax credits, it's very hard to aim where you want it to go. Um, there's good efforts and good interest in trying to expand it further, say, to non-custodial non parents. Uh, but at the end of the day, the minimum wage targets everyone in that market in the way the EITC often misses. And third is that um, I really don't like the arguments that say um, like food stamps subsidizes low-wage workers. I don't think, first of all, I don't think it works that way. And second of all, I think that's kind of a really bad argument. But the ITC, by pushing people in the labor force, does subsidize employers slightly um, by essentially giving them, a, as brought up, a bigger pool of workers. They can bring down wages slightly. And there's some reasonable estimates that say about a quarter of the EIT is essentially captured by employers. The minimum wage pushes back against that and forces them to kind of dislodge some of that back to workers. And I think that's a very helpful thing to do. Um, I think I have one minute left, is that right? OK, so, I, um, so a big minimum wage, and we'll talk about this more later. Um, you know, the, the value is eroded greatly. Um, you know, what will happen? Um, what, I think this is a good experiment. Uh, this is the point of a federalist government. Uh, we'll see what happens in New York and California and Seattle and elsewhere, and we'll be able to use that evidence. But I think there's some reasons to be optimistic. One is that the values eroded it in half, essentially, especially against the median wage. So the minimum wage is much lower than it used to be, and it's a big jump at first and then a slow, gradual increase. Uh, a lot of the jobs impacted are not tradable, so I don't think they're going to move over the border into Arizona. Um, you know, we'll see what happens with that. It is possible that many jobs would be placed with machines. Um, we'll see what happens with that. But that also, you know, in terms of productivity, might be very good because when you have a large stagnant labor pool with no wage increases over decades, there's really not any incentive to innovate and productivity, and particularly productivity per worker, has been stagnating quite a bit, especially in the past 10 years. Um, and at that point, and I will conclude there. Thank you very much, Mike Consul. <laughs> Having completed the opening argument round, we will now move on to rebuttals. With seven minutes for each side, we'll begin, please, with Don Boudreaux. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. I have nothing prepared here except what I did up there as Mike was speaking. Uh, let me start with the point of a agreement. We don't have much, but I'll start with one. I agree with Mike that the EITC partially subsidizes employers. Uh, and I'm also glad to hear that him, him say that uh, 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 cash uh, programs, uh, contrary to what you hear a lot of people argue, do not subsidize uh, employers. In fact, quite the opposite. Um, so I'm going to go down his, as best as I can his points in order, the order that Mike made them. Uh, it is true that there are this is not the place to debate the detailed econometrics of, min of minimum wage studies. It gets very esoteric very quickly, which means very boring for most people. Uh, uh, the Newmark and Washer, who I mentioned this, this book, they've actually looked at the state, at state border effects. 
And not surprisingly, they found that minimum wages do have negative employment effects. Uh, that's the way this empirical debate goes. If you, it's almost the case, if you want to find something in the data, you can look hard enough and find it. As Ronald Coase, the late Nobel Prize winner, said, maybe it was said by a lot of people, but the way I understand he said it is that if you torture the data long enough, they will eventually confess. And that's <laughs> especially possible in this case. Look, the minimum wage uh, uh, is paid to roughly 4% of American workers. We have a $17 trillion economy. It's very dynamic. It's changing. All sorts of things are happening at, at, at any one time. To detect the effects of what are usually relatively small changes in wages for very tiny group of workers uh, is really difficult. The analogy I draw is, is it's, 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 it's if we're standing in front of a big gigantic, say three times the size of an Olympic sized swimming pool, swimming pool, and people are jumping in and there's rain and there's humidity and, and all sorts of things going on and someone drops a pebble in or, or a small ball and there are econometricians, they're trying to measure the effect on the water level and then they say, oh, we found no effect. Uh, your, it, the, your reason tells you that when you drop the ball in, the water level of that pool is going to be higher than it would otherwise be, even if econometricians can find no effects. So some econometricians find negative effects, other econometricians find no negative effects. Um, but still, the bulk of studies, two-thirds according to Newmark and Washer, are that there are negative effects. Um, the, um, uh, the price effects that Mike mentioned, uh, those are often cited as a a reason why minimum wages don't harm workers. You know, well, every, the prices of all the goods rise a little bit, and that enables employers to recoup the higher labor costs, and so everybody's happier. Consumers pay slightly higher prices, and workers get higher wages. That argument, too, overlooks the law of demand. If the prices of goods start, the prices of goods that are produced by low skilled workers rises, that means consumers buy fewer of those goods. And if consumers buy fewer of those goods and services, uh, employers will need fewer workers to produce those goods and services. And so even if the prices do rise to the full extent of the minimum wage, you still get a reduction in the demand for low-skilled workers. The efficiency wage argument, I must admit, I, 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 I find um, uh, completely uh, unpersuasive. Uh, if it's the case that raising workers' wages makes, raises in workers' productivity such that it pays the employer to raise wages and experience from their workers at higher productivity. There is no reason on earth why the government has to force employers, most of whom operate in highly competitive markets, to raise those wages. They'll raise the wages on their own. We don't need the government to, to tell employers to do what is profitable for employers, admittedly profitable for employers to do. Mike's right, by the way, that we witness after minimum wage hikes uh, more capital investment. But the reason is very different from the one he suggests. Capital is, a sub capital is often a substitute for labor. You get, if you know, President Obama said it many years ago, you get the ATM substituting for the, for the bank teller. When the minimum wage rises, one way that employers respond to that hike in the minimum wage is to substitute machinery, some non-human process, which is not governed by minimum wage legislation, for the minimum wage uh, workers. And so yes, we get more capital uh, in, uh, uh, in investment, which is precisely one of the things that, in, that helps uh, employers deal with fewer workers. Um, as far as the, monops the monopsony argument, I don't want to get too technical, this is the main theoretical reason why, why minimum wages could possibly work in reality. I tell my students all the time that I'm really not interested in what's possible. I'm interested in what's plausible. Almost anything is possible. It's possible an elephant will fall through the ceiling right now and kill us all as an overhead flying circus and the thing. But we don't worry about that. <laughs> it's just implausible. I find it to be implausible, highly implausible, that there is monopsony power in the low-skilled labor market. One of the few advantages of being a low-skilled worker is that basically you do menial jobs, and menial, the menial jobs can be transferred pretty easily from one employer to another. It's not like being uh, a, a pediatric gastroenterologist where you can only do that one thing. Uh, but being a day laborer, being a clerk in a supermarket, your, your tasks are pretty um, uh, exchangeable across markets. Um, one of the uh, of course, you know, a lot of immigrants, both, both documented and undocumented, uh, are minimum wage 
workers. And these people, I admire them. They, many of them uh, risk lives and leave their families. They move from their homes, oftentimes undertaking uh, great risks to come to find better jobs in America. It's, it's inconceivable to me that once they're here, they wouldn't move from McDonald's to Burger King over there uh, if Burger King is offering higher wages. And indeed, if McDonald's is underpaying those workers, then Burger King has every incentive to offer those workers higher wages. Um, on, the, on the issue of poverty, excuse me, how, how much time do I have left? One minute. So just one, on the issue of poverty, it is true, as Mike says, there are studies that show that minimum wages uh, are, correspond to poverty reduction. There's also evidence uh, in the opposite direction. Again, I'm quoting from the uh, Newmark and Washer book. This is uh, from their concluding uh, chapter. Uh, it's, it says, uh, no compelling evidence that minimum wages on net help poor or low-income families, and some evidence that minimum wages adversely affect these families and increase poverty. So it's another instance where you can find in the data uh, almost anything you want, which is why I think we have to rely upon basic economic theorizing to give us some guidance as to what's going on. Thank you. Dan Boudreau, thank you very much. Now with seven minutes for his rebuttal, we welcome back Mike Consul. Seven and 10 minutes feels like a long time, but then you're doing it and then it's like right on you. All right, so seven minutes. So a couple, a couple points to what Don brought up. One is the, uh, the concept of um, this is only a good idea if nobody ever loses their job or no, there's no loser in this transaction. That's not often how we do economic policy. And here people are thinking critically about economic policy. When we look at, say, the TPP or NAFTA or other kinds of big trade agreements, we don't say, will any single person lose their job from the TPP? If so, then we shouldn't do it. That's just not part of the way economists approach the problem. Uh, it's not the way a rational debate would happen. The rational debate says, look at the benefits and look at the costs. Um, you know, free trade would make us all richer as long as it's not a you know, proxy for uh, deregulation and, and other things like that. Um, and we understand the way that, you know, you can kind of rationally look at the pros and the cons. I think the studies are just much more broadly in favor of the fact that higher minimum wage reduces poverty. I suppose we can negotiate that, but the scope of the job losses are just simply not in the range that would be needed for there to be no benefit for people who gain higher wages under the minimum wage. Now, I would not accept large job losses at all to increase the minimum wage, which is why I'm looking very carefully at how these $15 minimum wages go in Seattle, LA, and elsewhere. But I do think the scope of what we're talking about, if you kind of take the middle ground between the two sets of studies, the costs are relatively low relative to the large gains. Many economists supported the minimum wage. Now, the, the poll question Don brought up was just about whether or not there'd be significant losses. And at the time, I remember people debating what does significant mean or whatever the word was. Um, but many economists supported the minimum wage before this range of thinking about search models and efficiency wages and you know, these big studies on big databases because they understood that this is part of the portfolio of tools that we use. Uh, Don originally brought up talk about, um, uh, discuss the idea that it's going to draw in people into the labor force. I actually think that's essential and important part of the minimum wage. Um, I'm not worried about it pulling in um, housewives, was I think the phrase used. Uh, what I know, notice when I look out, there's a large amount of detached people who are sitting on the sidelines of the economy. And I think one important part is because low wage work just simply doesn't pay as much as it should. And I think to the extent it brought in a lot of people who have dropped out of the labor force, I think that's very important. Um, you know, there's, what's the, um, another thing I didn't get a chance to bring up earlier is that there's also a simplicity about the minimum wage that's very easy to target. It's targeted locally. It's targeted at the point of where the transaction happens in the labor market. It's not trying to be done after the fact through complicated tax codes, through trying to subsidize wages, which are tr trying to subsidize employers providing wages, which you know sounds easy, and it certainly is easy in an economic blackboard, but it's actually very difficult in practice. And it also, um, and I think that's why it has such a throughput that's very important and really kind of pushes back on some of the ways, other parts of the way we tackle poverty and low wage work um, kind of falters. And I, I think it's essential because, you know, we talked about experimenting with poor workers. That's what Don brought up. And we're experimenting right now by letting them live in poverty. Um, you know, there's a lot of debate about the minimum wage, but there's no debate about the real effects of deep poverty on children, 
the real effects of deep poverty on people, on society, on attention spans. Um, some people talk about it on, is the effect of having a severe drug addiction. Uh, and the fact that we are not pushing with the tools that we have available, tools that we know work, to try to reduce poverty is essential. I think a crucial thing about the minimum wage is the way we talk about it now, and I think this is very different as well from a few decades ago, is the jobs we are talking about are the new normal. Manufacturing's not coming back. The whole idea that we're all gonna be post-technology knowledge workers is kind of a, you know, kind of a scam. The future is going to be in retail, the future is going to be in services, and those jobs are miserable and difficult right now, and they don't pay very well. So when we think about trying to make those jobs the jobs that can be solid working class jobs in the future, one of the crucial ways we're going to do it is by making sure that it pays well, making sure the people who work those jobs have a level of economic security. Now, if people were talking about like, well, why don't we just have a big basic, universal basic income or just swamp the whole market with the earned income tax credit, then we don't need a minimum wage. Well, yeah, I think that would kind of be interesting. We could talk about it. I, I still think there's a reason we might want a low minimum wage, but that's not the debate we're having. We're talking about having several different fronts on this war against poverty and against insecure labor. And if we don't take these actions, that's the real experiment, is letting 10%, 12% of our population live in poverty, letting children grow up in poverty. That's a real experiment with people's lives that we are actively doing by not taking these chances. Thank you, Mike Consul. That concludes the rebuttal portion of our debate this evening. With that, we move on to closing arguments where each of our debaters will have four minutes to wrap up the arguments. I would also ask the members of our audience to give some thought whether you'd like to chime in for after our closing arguments, you will have the opportunity to take one of the microphones in the back and ask your questions. With that, for closing arguments, please thank Don Boudreau. Please. Getting a lot of exercise tonight. Um, the, there's a fundamental difference between job losses created by minimum wages and job losses created by trade. First of all, uh, I would be more sympathetic to the argument that Mike raises if for once I would hear a prominent politician or pundit say something like the following. People, we're going to raise the minimum wage. Now, it's going to put some of you out of jobs. Understand that. But don't worry, others of you will get higher wages. And that's a trade-off. Those of you who are unemployed, well, that's the cost that you have to bear while these other people get higher wages. But I never hear that. What you hear in the public debate is that the minimum wage will cause no unemployment. Go to President Obama's website, the White House website. It's a myth, says the website, that minimum wages destroy jobs. I don't think it is a myth. But, it, but the, the pundits who support it, primarily, in the public, deny that there's a trade-off. Trade does cause some job losses, but it's not a fundamental part of the nature of trade. There's nothing about trade that keeps the number of jobs lower than it would otherwise be. It's a, it's a, it's a frictional change. Anytime there's a change in the economy, some people lose jobs and other people gain jobs. It's not a policy that, by its nature, reduces the number of jobs in the economy. The minimum wage is a policy that, by nature, reduces the number of jobs in an economy. By nature, job losses from a minimum wage are permanent. That's not the case with job losses from trade. Um, now, I agree with Mike that reducing poverty is an important um, uh, policy, considerations of how to reduce policy are of the highest importance. By the way, reducing poverty not only in the US, but also, but also abroad. Uh, it, it sometimes amuses me that some of the, uh, not Mike, but, but some proponents of the minimum wage in the US uh, claim a great affection for poor people, but are willing to impose trade restrictions uh, that not only harm poor people at home, but make poor people abroad, people who are much poorer than even the poorest Americans, um, worse off. It seems to be a moral disconnect uh, if you're trying to help relatively poor American workers by making even much poorer foreign workers uh, worse off. Anyway, I agree that, 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 that solving poverty, dealing with poverty, is important. But the fundamental point here is uh, to quote Thomas, the economist Thomas Sowell, uh, reality is not optional. The question is not uh, should we reduce poverty. The question is what are the best ways to do it? If the economics, the standard economics of the minimum wage is correct, as I believe it to be, then it's a bad 
means of reducing poverty. You make poverty worse, not better. So again, the dispute is not over, should we undertake policies that reduce poverty? Everyone agrees that we should. I do, certainly. The question is, what are those policies? The minimum wage, I believe, is, 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 the, is the opposite of such a policy. It prices some workers out of jobs. Those workers lose not only income today, they lose the opportunities to get higher paying jobs in the future because, in part, they lose the job experience today. Um, so when Mike talks about insecure labor, I agree we should be concerned about insecure labor, but I can't think of any policy that makes labor more insecure than one that tells workers, you may not, you may not, to get a job, offer to work for a wage below the minimum. If you, if you, are not, if you cannot produce for your employer value at least equal to the minimum wage, you are prohibited by law from working. That makes jobs insecure. That makes workers insecure. I think it's just an immoral policy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, excellent. Yeah. So, um, four minutes. Um, you know, for the people who lose jobs as a result of international trade, I mean, they obviously feel it. Um, it's not. I don't think it's worth going in that detour, but. We make policy debates all the time that feature trade-offs. And if I told you that there is a policy that could radically reduce the level of poverty, um, that could impact and give benefits to working single mothers, people with children, people in their prime earning years, 25 to 54, that it could reduce it with virtually no overhead, virtually no cost to the government, that supplements and makes much more effective other measures that involve deploying public funds towards poor people, uh, and that crucially will help dignify and build up service labor as an essential working class job, a job that you can feed your family on, a job that can give you the ability to have a secure lifestyle. I think it's the most moral thing in the world to take on that option. I think certainly when you look at it from the costs and the benefits, the benefits are real. Um, from implementation all the way down to the bigger paychecks millions of people will receive as a result of these state level um, targets. But I also told you that you could target the minimum wage at states that are rich to have them higher. I don't, I don't personally actually think a $15 minimum wage is appropriate for most states, uh, as opposed to, say, some other people in the Democratic Party. Um, but for a rich state, I think it is very much worth trying to see how far you can push and see what the costs and the benefits are. I think if you look at in between the studies, the costs in terms of job loss are not that large. And to be honest with you, I find the studies that would say that they're much closer to zero, more convincing. But even if not, think of the, how bad could it get? You know, the, even in the poor estimates, they're not that bad in terms of job losses. And I think the benefits are real, concentrated, and necessary for our economy to go forward. Thank you so much. So that concludes a formal portion of our debate. With that, we open the microphones in the back up for a question and answer. Anyone who would like from the audience who would like to weigh in at this point um, may please make their way to the microphones in the back. If you like, ah. you can direct your question to either of the two speakers or both. Oh, uh, I'll, I'll give them both a chance. Uh, because what I'd like to do, it's my impression that uh, internationally, the ratio of the minimum wages in Europe, Eastern Europe, even in uh, South America, in a lot of countries, to the median wage is higher than it is here. And I'm just wondering if there's been any investigation into what sort of distortions uh, can be found in these other countries. That's my question. Uh, I'm sure Mike will disagree with me. Yes, they have been, I mean, he won't disagree with this. They have been investigations. As I read those investigations, uh, those international studies, uh, they find disemployment effects, as standard economics predicts. I just happened to read a day or two ago a study of Canada, uh, and the Canadian, I forget the exact numbers, but it was significant. The recent hike in the Canadian minimum wage caused I know I'm being recorded, so I've got to get this close to right. Some, somewhere between a 5 and 6% increase in the unemployment there of low-skilled workers or workers who are proxies for low-skilled um, uh, workers. 
there are studies that show the opposite. This is another example of, of being able to find in the data almost anything you want to find. Again, it's because low-skilled workers, minimum wage workers, in all the industrialized countries are a tiny fraction of the workforce. It's also made a little complicated because a lot of states, um, a lot of European countries don't have minimum wage because they have sectoral level bargaining, right? So that's, you know, there's many states that don't have it but have extensive union presence in their you know, kind of industrial level bargaining. And, you know, that's more aggressive in terms of its, uh, you know, poverty reducing or, or wage boosting. Um, I think the big thing, here, here's what I'd say, and this is, we simply don't have the historical data for it, is you want to look at big increases, right? I think that's what is going on with the 15. We've kind of talked about the minimum wage as kind of like a fundamental issue as opposed to a, a very high minimum wage or an aggressive one. Um, there's some places in Eastern Europe that increase their minimum wage, say 50% in a short period of time. We did it in the early 50s or maybe 48. To the extent you find job losses, right? And I, I think, you know, it's the same thing. You can torture the data, say whatever you want. I think it's important to look at the scale of the number that is the bad case scenario. And it does not kind of imply the classical model where if we were to raise the minimum wage one penny, every single minimum wage worker would lose their job and never be employable again, right? The kind of strict demand thing. We see, you know, even in the bad case, from a 50% increase, they're just not high enough to really think that there aren't these pushbacks in terms of the search and the efficiency of workers under a higher minimum wage. Yeah, this, this is uh, to the proponent of the uh, $15 minimum wage. Um, this is a, a form of price fixing. You're fixing the price of labor at a, at a certain thing. And I take it that, in, in general, it's a bad idea in, a, in an otherwise market economy to try to pick, fix the price of something with all of the secondary and tertiary effects that will have, because you know it's it's the uh, seals the once you once you set the price of one good, you have to then start setting the price of all the other goods that go in and compete with it. Now I take it that that um, you're not in favor of raising the minimum wage. I mean, why not to 20, 25, 50, right? Because it becomes obvious at those levels that there'd be massive unemployment. Um, so the, the question is, why would you think that $15 an hour corresponds to the um, uh, productivity of the average low-skilled worker? If, if, it's, if the productivity is, be is below $15 an hour, then in a competitive market, which fast food and restaurants and so forth are, um, that's going to um, Reduce, reduce the number of, uh, of people supplying that because they're, they're, paying, they're paying above the productivity of the workers. It will obviously cause substitution. I've been into some fast food places now that have iPads for ordering as opposed to, to uh, humans. Um, and I take it that will just be accelerated. So the question is wh why $15? Is there some, some assumption that most low-skilled workers are productive at $15 an hour already, and they're being, they're being paid less than uh, their productivity? Sure, so uh, there's a couple of really interesting points there. One is, will you have this kind of like road to serfdom where if you fix one price, you have to fix the other prices to keep it going? I've not seen that. Uh, we've had minimum wages nationally since 1938, and I don't think of a cascade of price fixing that is necessary to keep the minimum wage in place. Um, so, you know, it, it's very, it may have disemployment effects, it may do other things, but uh, the idea that it's kind of pushing us down this road of well, might... Excuse me, what it, what it does do is create a black, <coughs> a black market, right? So whenever you, you set the price above the productivity, you will have a black market. You will have people in the black market working for under the minimum wage, and I suspect we already do. Sure, I mean, you may, you may have that anyway under any kind of, you know, state status, non-anarcho-capitalist -anarcho system. Um, crucially, what, what I would say is, so, th so that's the first point, is I, I think that it's totally stationary and you can have a minimum wage without the economy kind of falling into this disarray. Um, is the 15 the perfect wage? I have no idea. This is why I want states to experiment. I want municipalities to experiment. I want the data to come in and we can kind of gauge it. One kind of rule of thumb people use is half the median wage, which nationwide is about $10. Um, that kind of gives a certain level of compression in the bottom half of the labor force that people are aiming for. 
Now that may also not be right, but again, it's why we do these small buildups and then we you know, set the federal level as a floor that's well below this. Um, that's what I think is, um, that's how I think people kind of come to that. Hello, okay. So I, this is to both of you. In your discussion, neither of you addressed or discussed the potential impacts of the people who are making increased money having more money to spend. So if it's the case that $15 an hour um, means that the people who are working in those service jobs have more money than they would otherwise have, often we spend our extra income on things like Starbucks or going out to dinner so that we're spending into the service economy. So is there any job creation effect as the result of having more money in the pool from those people? That's an argument that is frequently heard among uh, non-economist pundits and politicians for why the minimum wage uh, will not have disemployment effects. I know of no serious economists, even pro-minimum wage ones, who accept that argument for a variety of reasons. Number one, even if it's true that low-skilled workers, when the minimum wage goes up, have more money to spend, that money comes from somewhere. Their employers have less money to spend, or consumers who are paying more for those goods have less money to spend elsewhere. Secondly, and I think even more importantly, that argument sneaks in an important assumption that I believe is mistaken, and that is when the minimum wage rises, low-skilled workers get more money to spend. The ones who get raises get more money to spend. But if, as economists say, the demand for low-skilled workers is elastic, meaning that a rise in the minimum wage causes uh, a, a pretty significant reduction in the quantity demanded of workers, if that's the case, and it's possible that it is, then the total amount of money that low-skilled workers get as a result of the minimum wage, it actually falls. They have less money than before. Thirdly, and most importantly, actually, is there's no reason to believe that the money that, even if, even if all the, 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 the workers get higher wages, uh, that they will spend all those wages buying goods and services made with low-skilled workers. They'll spend some of it, but surely only a small fraction of it. For that argument to work, they'd have to spend all of it. And it becomes kind of a lift yourself up magically by your own bootstraps theory. You can't make people richer by giving them more money to spend on things they buy. To make people richer, you need more real goods and services and real effort. And raising the minimum wage doesn't do much of that. Um, the uh, CBO, when they estimated the losses from a 10 uh, minimum wage two years ago, three years ago, uh, had a stimulus effect in it. So, I mean, economists do talk about it. You know, they're employed as economists in the CBO. Um, you know, we're looking at the Bank of Japan right now is trying to think very hard about whether or not they can force price increases into labor contracts to try to break secular stagnation. Uh, and as we go to the 10th year of ultra low interest rates in the private market with 10 years having fallen a third, uh, with inflation consistently well below what the Fed is trying to target, um, I think a one-time spending boost would be helpful. Now, of course, the idea that it would have a stimulus effect assumes that we're kind of in this per period of secular stagnation, a period where the economy is very weak. Let's say you don't buy that. Um, I do think there's a broader thing about having people with more money. And, and again, I don't think the idea that it's unit elastic, the idea that if you raise the minimum wage 10%, incomes and jobs will fall 10%. That's not in the studies. That's not in the, the range of what people talk about. People have more income. Um, they're able to make rent. Uh, I don't know if people have read this amazing book called Evicted by Matthew Desmond, but the idea that you know a lot of people are evicted all the time because of $100, because of $150. Um, people will be able to invest in their kids. People will be able to keep their kids fed which we know has a stimulative effect down the road because it means they're much less likely to commit crimes, much more likely to be productive workers. So I feel, you know, you can talk about the aggregate demand that's gonna kind of set people up one way or the other, but the idea of investing with incomes in poor communities is incredibly important. We know we've seen this from the ITC because we can watch that very closely uh, for who does and does not have kids in a way that's very hard for the minimum wage. But to the extent a third of people who are going to benefit from this minimum wage increase have children, we know it's going to make for a more secure community that is economically more rich. Um, my question, first of all, is for, uh, is it on? Oh, sorry. Okay. Get your mic off. There it is. 
Just there we go. Got it. All right, for you. Uh, first of all, <laughs> I forgot your name, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so the first one, real quick, is regarding the uh, price increases. So was, is, that, is your claim that the pressure from the increased minimum wage will come through increased prices? Because I remember you making that claim. Okay. One of three ways it would push back, yes. Okay, cool. So um, according to, I think, the CBO, I forget where, uh, like a third of minimum wage workers are, uh, well, first of all, it's only 3% of all workers. Correct? Is that right? Three or four percent. Okay, but everyone who buys products made from minimum wage workers is generally going to be um, under privileged having low income, correct? Because people who produce minimum wage products, it's McDonald's, uh, Walmart, low priced goods, correct? Um, is that the question? Um, no, I see no reason to believe that. It's retail, it's home health care, it's traded, uh, it, it's services, it's, you know, it's maids, right? It's people, you know, people who go into McMansions and clean the toilets. Okay. So, I was trying to ask it indirectly. I'll just get straight to it. So you are arguing, I think, that the people who produce minimum wage things are single mothers. You said one third, I think. Um, but the people who pay the other prices, I don't think you spoke about them. So if everyone who makes minimum wage things were uh, people with very low incomes, but everyone who buys them also has very low incomes, then wouldn't it be a wash? Um, that's a really important point. I can see absolutely that. The three things that would push back against a minimum wage would be price throughput, um, and then things having to do with search and efficiency. Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. The thing is, is that how much is that? I don't, I don't think it's one for one, right? I mean, I don't think, um, remember the wage is just one determinant of the final price of those goods. Uh, and crucially, a lot of those things are consumed by middle class, working class, and, you know, upper income families. Um, I don't, you know, I don't think keeping people in poverty so that the prices of the things they go up don't go up from, you know, like I, I just, I don't see that as being sufficiently large of an effect. I've seen people try to estimate it. Um, it does have some effect, but it's nowhere near even remotely the kind of trade-off, the heavy trade-off that you're describing there. Don might have a different agreement. And I would just say that, that uh, uh, and I don't like pointing to these empirical studies because it's so easy to find what you want in them. Uh, but Thomas McCurdy, who's a prominent... That was the study I got it That's, from. Yeah, I was trying in, the, to in the Journal of Political Economy, <laughs> came out sometime in 2015, he found that the uh, rising, that the higher prices that do result as a, as a consequence of higher minimum wages are indeed paid disproportionately by low-income families, thus wiping out a large part of the gain. Not wiping it out completely for those who do uh, stay employed at the minimum wage, but wiping out a portion of it. Yeah, I spent a week trying to read it, like two months ago. <laughs> so that was the one I was kind of asking about. I guess one more quick one. Um, speaking of recent mm -hmm. ones. We've got other sorry. people behind you. Oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you. <laughs> All right, guys, thanks for coming. It's great to have you here. I appreciate, uh, if you, you can stand in the back of the line if we've got time, but I think it's good to rotate through. Uh, thanks for coming. What I really appreciate is that you both seem to have an appreciation for low wage workers, and I think that's good. Uh, I'm very concerned about the people at the very bottom of the labor market. I'm concerned that if the minimum wage is a binding constraint, it's going to affect those people the most, the people who are most vulnerable to be homeless. I'm concerned about the homeless population. I did my dissertation looking at income choices and earnings of homeless people. So my question, I guess, to Mike is, if you can't justify $15 as the ideal dollar figure, and I'm concerned that you can't, frankly. I thought this was gonna be a little bit more about $15 versus 12 versus 20. Uh, if, you, if we can't justify that as the optimal minimum wage, are we going to put in place uh, some public works programs or something in California to pick up some of those folks at the very bottom rung who may well, in fact, be impacted by the higher minimum wage? Do you advocate for that?
So there, there's a couple dimensions here, right? There, there's people who are so entrenched in poverty that simply getting a job maybe isn't necessarily an easy thing for them to do. Perhaps they're homeless, perhaps they have addiction, perhaps they have other things that are preventing them from um, impacting the job market. I mean, to the extent that I'm all for tackling those problems with every tool that we have, right? So to the extent that a, I don't know, like a Marshall Plan of some sort for, for poor communities is essential, you know, could be done, it should be done. I don't know if that's part of the California debate. I, to the extent I followed it, I've not seen those kinds of things. You, know, you can tackle it with a universal basic income. There's other ways you can try to tackle this. But I do think of the minimum wage as part of that portfolio. And that's the real thing I would emphasize. I'm not trying to sell this as a silver bullet. A lot of people do. Uh, I think, you know, the, bit, the best thing you can do is expand Medicaid into the states that it hasn't, right? Getting poor people access to health care or people who or defending Medicaid, right, is like as essential in terms of these kinds of things. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of um, YIMBYism, like yes in my backyard, expanding housing so that people who are at the margins have less housing costs, right? I think we want to think of this as how it hangs together with other things. If the minimum wage caused large job losses, then we'd have to reevaluate how to do it, but you would still maybe think about it in terms of amplifying other things than simply just pulling back on the minimum wage. Because even at the minimum wage where it was in 2005, right, um, or let's say 2003, a relatively historical low, and inflation adjusted, those communities weren't particularly well served by the market. A, a general point about a, a point you make. Um, I understand that you thought it was gonna be you know, $12 versus 15. And, and uh, that question or that point uh, points to another aspect of the whole minimum wage debate that I, I think often gets missed. Uh, when economists, the best economists discuss, even the best pro-minimum wage economists discuss it, they talk about it as if it's a policy that's going to be implemented apolitically by by scientific uh, politicians and bureaucrats in a lab who look only at the data and have no political influences, uh, I think it's a mistake. $15 is a number basically just chosen out of the air. Uh, you know, why not? You know, surely, if there were an optimal minimum wage, it's highly unlikely it would be $15 for all of California. Nevada City is very different than San Francisco, which is very different than, than San Diego. Um, and so, it, 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 we must always keep in mind that the minimum wage is like all other government policies. It's made in a political um, uh, uh, milieu, sometimes I would say muck. And that reality means that we can't presume that even if there was a, an, a, a correct scientific outcome, the political process is not the, the place where that correct scientific outcome will be discovered and implemented with any reliability. So yeah, I think that's incredibly important, but it leads me to the opposite conclusion, right? Expanding the ITC makes TurboTax a lot richer, right? Um, we could help solve a lot of poverty right now by just mailing people their tax codes, right? You're mailing people who don't have to itemize their taxes already done for them. You know why we don't? Grover Norquist doesn't like it because he thinks it'll be easier to raise taxes, and TurboTax hates it because it comes out of their bottom line. So all of our earned income tax credit is dominated by ideology and by political interest. The minimum wage, it is possible that low wage workers could push it up too high. Um, but at the end of the day, the minimum wage is incredibly simple to administer. Uh, it's done right at the point, of, I mean, it is, in terms of being captured and being run amok and run aground in kind of a public choice way, it is the least thing to worry about in terms of our tools to tackle poverty. So my question goes to both of you in response to a couple of Mike's points. You said that raising the minimum wage, I think one of them was that it, people would be more likely, those people who don't see the benefit of working at 10.50 an hour would be pulled in for 15 an hour. And on top of that, you mentioned that people switch jobs less often, are more willing to stay for a longer time. I was wondering if you think that's a positive thing in the, in the long run for the entire wage force. Because to me, I'm not an economist, but my first impression is you're going to head from four up towards 5% of people working at minimum wage. And on top of that, you have them staying there for a longer time with less incentive to educate themselves or 
reach for a higher job. I'm sure Mike will have something to say in response as well. I'll, I'll try to be very brief. Um, when I mentioned that raising the minimum wage attracts retirees and, and uh, housewives and some college students into the labor pool, um, I think it's, it, it's correct, it does. It's much more attractive to work at a higher wage than at a lower wage, and when the wage is so low, some people just say, I don't want to work, I'll stay, and I'll just be a full-time student. Um, and my point is that these people who have some experience, who are generally more desirable workers than a lot of truly low-skilled you know, low workers who are young teens with no job experience at all, maybe their English skills are poor, um, maybe they don't have their own means of, 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 of transportation, they have to rely upon unreliable public transportation. When these other people are attracted into the labor force, uh, they displace the lower-skilled workers. Um, as far as people, the job turnover being lower, that's true. The data show that pretty unambiguously. The reason I believe that so is that when you are lucky enough to retain a job at the minimum wage, you, do, you, you are especially uh, uh, eager to hang on to it because you know there aren't that many, or there are fewer alternative jobs out there for you than there would be if there were no minimum wage. Um. Do I worry that people would, would I, I think the idea is that like they would prevent them from climbing the job market because it would be too stable. Um, no, that's not a big concern for me. Um, one thing that could happen, and I'll put this a little bit more controversial because it's a collegiate setting, is it may make the marginal college student not try to get higher education. Why I think higher education is a fantastic opportunity for most people. Uh, and modal people, at the margins, we have a big problem with people dropping out with high student debt, people who are underprepared, trying to achieve at the collegiate level, and falling into predatory um, schools and other things that, you know, if a person does not go to college for two years and drops out with 30 grand in debt just to take a low minimum wage shops, but instead we've, you know, and this was, um, Hillary Clinton's talked about this and other people, that we need to make more opportunities for people who don't simply go to college, right? People go to college with maybe 25% of the labor force, 33% for, for younger workers. Um, you know, we need to think in terms of the fact that a lot of the jobs we're talking about are not aberrations, right? They are part of how the economy is gonna work going forward. Manufacturing is not coming back. Everyone who is poor is not gonna become a knowledge worker. Um, there's gonna be services, there's gonna be retails, there's gonna be healthcare, and a lot of those jobs are difficult and tough and we want to make sure that they're they're paid well so I, I do think it could have the effect you're having and i think broadly that would be good i do not worry about someone being so comfortable at a mcdonald's that they wouldn't take another opportunity um that's just an argument for like low wages in general i suppose hi uh, my question's for mike um you mentioned in your closing argument that um different states with like lower cost of living, it would not make as much sense for them to raise their minimum wage to $15. So why would it not, why would it make sense to raise minimum wage at a statewide level when you could do it at a local level instead? It's a good question. And um, you know, we'll see how it plays out, whether or not uh, the California was too bold and 15 nationwide and should have, let's let LA see what happened there, right? I'm totally open to this question. Um, there's reasons states are good units of economic activity in many cases. You, you necessarily, it's harder to move across state lines in, in a way that's um, less hard for cities and counties. Um, state's a unit of economic management. It's, um, it's a, you know, a place where it happens. In theory, could you imagine like a minimum wage block by block or crucially business by business, perhaps? But at some point you have to make the call at what level it's implemented at. And I think it's absolutely correct that you wanna see you know, high income cities, um, have higher minimum wage, places particularly where the capital stock is immobile, like airports or Las Vegas have a higher minimum wage than say places that are much poorer and much more rural. Um, but targeting that is, is part of the messy act of, of getting this going. And, you know, I, I think there's a lot, you know, there's very good reasons to do it at the state level as the kind of, you know, unit of management. Thank you. We've got time for one more question with apologies to others in the queue. Uh, I have one last question for Mike. Sorry to put you on the spot repeatedly. <laughs> um, 
I thought it was really interesting that you said that service and uh, retail will be the new normal, because it certainly appears that way. But are you worried that choosing policy decisions based on what sectors happen to be doing right, right now might be kind of trying to play God with the economy and kind of undermine the ability of sectors having unforeseen growth and innovation? Thanks. No, not particularly. I mean, I, I want to be clear. The minimum wage has been around since 1938. We've had an economy since 1938. It's across every Western nation. The ones that don't do it do much more aggressive kinds of wage bargaining at the sectoral level. So I don't think this is some sort of like madman, you know, out of control thing. I think it's something that's been part of our policy portfolio for handling low wage work since the 1930s and across Western nations. Um, I think you maybe can argue about how aggressively we should push it as part of the portfolio of policies, but I don't think a priori it's, it's, it's you know, playing God with the economy or, or something out of the historical or international norm. Um, it is possible that those sectors will substitute more into capital. I think that's been brought up a couple times. Um, it's not clear to me that that's necessarily the worst outcome, right? If we can make our economy much more productive, uh, if we can put capital to use, uh, it seems weird that we would want to keep people poor on the assumption that we would want to keep productivity low or kind of keep the capital stock from growing that way. Um, you know, I don't think when we look back, you know, the introduction of the car put a lot of horses out of business, right? It's not a reason we, you know, self-driving cars will put a lot of drivers out of business. That's no reason not to create a policy atmosphere that encourages self-driving cars, right? We understand this in other sectors. And I, I don't actually think it'll be as big of a deal. Um, fast food restaurants have become way more capital intensive in the past 30 years, and they still employ people all the time. Um, but to the extent it is, there's also, it's, you know, there's a pro and a con to it. I hope you found this evening's conversation as illuminating as I did. Will you all please join me in warmly thanking once more Don Boudreaux and Mike Conte. There's somebody in the control room who can advance the, uh, the slide here. I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, if you can, I know you don't want to probably fill out the survey right now, but if you take a photo of that URL up there, and if you could take five minutes over the next day or so just to fill out a couple short questions about the Unite, uh, I'd really appreciate it. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. I know I've left here with more information about the minimum wage and a lot more questions about the policy than I had when I walked in, and I hope that's the experience that you have too. Uh, please uh, feel free to follow the center on Twitter or send us an email if you want more information about our future events. We hope to see you at, uh, at more debates like this in the future. Thank you.